That's wonderful. Some places have wireless microphones. This one has an umbilical, which I had to plug in before I could communicate. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to explore once again what the future has in store for all of us and in particular for the folks in Oregon. Uh, I take note that I'm saying back again uh, because I was in this speaking series back in January of 1996, three years ago. Now, return engagements are a tricky problem for futurists. All right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, if you get it right, people say, why bother to invite him back? He already told us what the future is going to be. And if I get it wrong, why bother to invite him back? He was wrong. So, in fact, when ISEP approached me about this, they said, uh, would you have different content three years from now? And I said, sure, the future is three years closer. We can see it a hell of a lot clearer than we did three years ago. And so that's what I'm going to do, is to say we have traveled or certainly I have traveled three years and two months in time, and I'm, I'm right here where I was three years, two months ago. Uh, so I haven't physically moved, but uh, temporally, I'm into the future three more years and can bring things up to date. And in fact, the future is much clearer now and considerably more promising than it looked three years ago. Three years ago, when we last left the future, <laughs> um, I used, I used this transparency in particular, and I said, you know, things don't look all that good at the moment. For the last 22 years, wages have been falling in America, uh, an average of 15%. For men, it was even worse. Male wages fell 22%. Uh, women's wages fell about 7%. The gap between men and women closed in the last 25 years, not because the women caught up, because the men lost so much ground. And as a consequence of that decline, uh, one out of five American full-time workers were earning less than a poverty wage in 1995. Wow, one out of five full-time working a 40-hour week and still bringing home less than a poverty wage. Among young people, it was even worse. 47% of the entry-level labor pool, the 19 to 24-year-olds, earned less than a poverty wage even though they worked a full-time job. And when we went to The Economist to say, guys, what is the problem here? The Economist said, well, it's productivity. Uh, productivity just isn't going up as fast as it used to. Uh, for the first 25 years after the Second World War, productivity in this country went up about 2.5% a year. Every year, year after year after year. Which meant wages went up for everybody an average of 25 to 3% a year. Year after year after year, the American dream came true with clockwork regularity. It was terrific. And then something went wrong, because after 1973 and the first OPEC embargo, uh, the rate of productivity improvement in America fell by more than half, to about 1, 1.1% a year. And that meant wages only went up about 1.5% a year on the average, and inflation ran considerably higher than that during most of the next 20 years. So we got very upset, and we said, how can we restore prosperity to America? And they said, well, you've got to make people more productive. And then we said, okay, well, we know how to do that. Uh, it's technology. So we adopted a bunch of policies that encouraged us to buy technology. And over a 10-year period from 1983 to 93, American employers spent $1 trillion on information technology. But productivity didn't go up. And because productivity didn't go up in spite of that capital investment, the economists came back and said, oh, now you've got another problem. Not only isn't productivity going up, but profitability is going down. And people are selling the stock in American companies and they're buying stock in uh, German companies and, and Japanese companies. We've got to restore profitability. Oh, dear, the captains of industry said, well, how do we do that? By, we couldn't do it by increasing productivity. The only other way to uh, increase profitability is to cut costs. And that's what they did, by golly, by laying off workers. Um, on the average, American employers laid off between one and one and a half million workers a year during the 70s. We entered the 80s, it shot up to three million a year. It stayed above two million a year all during the 70s, or 80s, and then it shot up to three and a half million a year. Every year during the 1990s, American employers have laid off at least three million people. A total of 48 million people terminated in mid-career, more than half the workforce. And when you take mid-career termination, Statistically, you take a 50% cut in lifetime earnings. This is a brutal event 
and it has occurred to almost half of all American workers in the last 15 years. Well, but the cabinets have been just said, we have to restore productivity. Now let's take a look at multi-factor productivity since we've cut all those costs and increased the, product, uh, the capital investment. Well, it still hadn't gone up. Productivity rose from the depths of the Great Depression until 1973 in America, almost without a break. It was spectacular. And then, for the next 20 years, it hasn't gone up, even though we spent trillions of dollars on new technology, even though we laid off almost 50 million people. We are, in fact, leaner and meaner and going nowhere faster. And so we raised the question, well, why didn't the layoffs and the productivity produce the benefits that we all expected? And at that point, the economic historians, whom I quoted when I was here back in 1996, the economic historians at Stanford said, well, uh, things haven't started to get better yet because it's not time yet. What do you mean it's not time yet? Well, they said, we've looked at how long it takes to completely retool a nation's economy and assimilate a fundamental new technology throughout all the layers and all the functions of all the institutions in an entire nation's economy. And it turns out that it takes two generations, 70 to 80 years. Wow, why should it take so long? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, what are we talking about here? Somebody invents a new tool. Hey, nice looking tool. We'll buy a bunch of those. We install the tool and, well, productivity isn't going up. You didn't train anybody. Oh, training, good idea. Train, 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 train. There. How long could that take? 10 years, maybe, and these guys say 75. Right. Why? Well, they said in the first place, uh, we're talking about changing a big system, and big systems are stable. They do not change radically over a short period of time. They have great internal inertia, and quite frankly, we like that feature of large systems a lot. I mean, the largest system we deal with on a regular basis is the solar system. And we like it that the solar system is stable, right? The sun's been rising in the east with some consistency now for several million years, and we've come to count on it, right? And the seasons proceed in an orderly measured pace. We do not live in a world in which it's winter on Monday, spring on Tuesday, summer on Wednesday. Mm, well, that's... <laughs> Since El Nino, things have been a little unstable, right? Well, and you can argue that the American economy, arguably the largest single human system on the face of this earth, and it too is usually stable, and it doesn't change radically over a short period of time. We cannot imagine the American economy being agrarian on Monday, industrial by Wednesday, service-based by Friday. It's a crazy idea. There's no way you could change a system that big that quick. And then the economic historians say, and what is that economy made up of? Oh, two and a half million large corporations, uh, 12 million small businesses, uh, 45,000 state, local, and federal government agencies. Almost all of these are pretty good-sized little bureaucracies. And those systems are also inert. They don't change very rapidly. And then there's finally another thing, said the economic historians. There's the technology. It takes time to mature. They said, in fact, during the first 25 years of a new technology, it is so expensive, so unreliable, so clunky, that it has no net impact on an economy whatsoever. And during the second 25 years of a new technology's life, it finally gets good enough that it has some local applications that produce local improvements in performance, but it's still so unreliable and still so expensive that it produces a downturn in economic performance and a reduction in prosperity. It takes, in fact, they said, 50 years, half a century, typically, for a fundamental new technology to get good enough that it consistently produces a positive return on investment. Wow, 50 years. Uh, well, how old is the computer? Ah, 50 years. Well, actually, 53 years. The first computer ever was switched on February 14, 1946, ENIAC the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. And what was ENIAC like? Well, to begin with, it was labor intensive. It took 12 people to run it. Secondly, it filled a room 30 by 50 feet. It weighed 30 tons. It cost half a million dollars. It consumed electricity at the rate of 174 kilowatts a second. <laughs> Enough to run a small city. When they turned ENIAC on on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania the first time, all the lights in West Philly went dim. 
pretty impressive technology. How many of these did they sell? <laughs> well, I didn't sell any. They only built the one, and it's still there. You can still visit ENIAC. It's still where they built it. It's too big to move. Um, and it's, we preserved it just like we preserved the Wright's first airplane down at the Smithsonian Institution on the mall in Washington. Uh, but this is a breakthrough technology, a historical uh, element, icon. It's not a marketplace tool. Well, when did the computer make it to the marketplace? Ooh, eight years later. 1954, IBM and Sperry Univac announced in April of that year their Model 1 computers. Okay, well, what were the 1950 computers like? Still pretty big. I started my career designing computer centers for the Internal Revenue Service back in the 50s. We bought a bunch of Sperry Univac 8300s. The machine was 29 feet long, nine and a half feet tall, weighed 13 tons, and when you wanted to service it, you opened the door on the side and you walked inside of it. <laughs> and the first thing you saw inside of a Sperry Univac 8300 was white frost-covered pipes like you'd walked inside a frozen meat locker. Now, why was that? Oh, because the first computers were vacuum tube technology. This machine had 1,600 vacuum tubes in it running at 480 degrees. The thing would set fire to itself and melt down if we didn't have industrial chillers pumping Freon through it to keep it cold. What's more, when you wanted to change from processing one kind of data to another, you had to have 2,500 programmers on the shop floor. The IRS ended up building 10 service centers, each 450,000 square feet, more than 10 acres, to hold the 5,500 people each required to service and support one Sperry Univac 8300. The first computers were like a labor-intensive industrial technology, like an open hearth furnace for making steel. You would buy one for your organization uh, every 10 years or so. In fact, in the speech he made unveiling the first IBM computers, the late Tom Watson, the founder of IBM, made this famous forecast. He said, we at IBM believe there is a worldwide market for at least five to seven computers a year, and IBM plans to make most of them. <laughs> five to seven a year. Well, they're like building battleships or aircraft carriers. But that was then, in 1954. Now we've moved forward 45 years in time. And uh, we've gone through four generations of the technology. Vacuum tubes, transistors, integrated circuit boards, finally silicon chips. You can buy the computing power of ENIAC for $1.19 on a chip about the size of the white part of your little finger. And the plunging cost and increasing power of computers means that since 1962, computers have become 1 million times more productive and 1,000 times less expensive. What would an automobile cost if the same efficiencies applied? Why, in fact, a luxury sedan would cost $2.40 and get half a million miles to the gallon of gas. <laughs> Boy, I'll take a six pack of those, huh? <laughs> of course, some wag this week earlier said, yeah, they'd probably crash six times a day, just like your computer, though. <laughs> Well, a lot of people uh, look at statistics like that and they say, oh, you statisticians, you come up with these really wowy figures. They don't mean anything. Oh, the hell they don't. The Commerce Department says uh, computers have fallen in price in America on the average 15% a year since the beginning of the 90s until 1997. And in 1997, they said the average price of all computers sold in America fell 22%. And that was enough that in 1997, the inflation rate was 1.7%, but if you back computers out of the market basket, it would have been 3%. The falling price of computers was so instrumental in our economy, it cut inflation in half. Last year, the average price of all computers sold in America fell 32%. And as a result, last year, the inflation rate for the preliminary estimate was 1.1%, and it would have been 2.5% if we put the computers out of that calculation. So the computers are, in part, keeping prices down for everything in America. Secondly, the falling price means that more and more Americans are buying computers, and 47.5% of all the families in America now have computers. That means by the end of the year 2000, 50%, half of all the households in America, will be computerized. And not only that, the Commerce Department announced in the fall of 1997 that information products and services <laughs> jumped right ahead of health, health and medicine to become the largest single industry in the United States. Wow. Wow. In just 50 years, we have made this technology 
powerful, cheap, and easy to use, and it sustains the largest single industry in the American economy. And we can say to ourselves, wow, that's great. We have finished the information revolution in only 50 years instead of the 75 years that these guys at Stanford said was going to be necessary. <laughs> and the guys at Stanford come back and they say, no, 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 guys, you're not out of this woods yet. To be sure, there is some really good news out there. We've gotten better and better at using information technology to actually add value in the marketplace. And as a result, the number of high-value jobs related to high-tech has grown substantially. In 1970, only 1% 1 of all the jobs in America paid a middle or an upper income wage and were in high-tech production or management. Today, in 1999, approximately 18 and a half of all the jobs, a percent of jobs in America are upper or middle income jobs in high tech production and management. Well, that's certainly to the good. But during the same period of time, says the Labor Department, the number of upper and middle income jobs in the labor intensive production and management sector, the old part of the core of our economy, has plunged from 60% of all the jobs in America down to under 25%. So we've eliminated many more middle class jobs than we have created. But in our 1992 book, my partner and I wrote this. If the historical pattern of techno-economic transition applies to the current moment in U.S. history, sometime during the second half of the 1990s, the numbers of new high-value jobs should finally begin to grow faster than the number of old high-value jobs eliminated from the old core of the economy. And when that happens, the total number of middle and upper income jobs in America should stop falling, turn around, and begin to rise. And if we pull this off right and don't screw it up, which, of course, we are entirely entitled to do, we are the world's greatest free market democracy. We can shoot ourselves in the foot at the polls any November we want. Uh, Pat Buchanan has announced he's running next year, so we're going to have the chance, right? <laughs> but if we don't screw this up, somewhere around 2010, the total number of middle and upper income jobs in America as a share of all the jobs will be higher than it has ever been in the history of the country. We said in 1992, the rising tide will lift most of the boats, just not right away. In fact, the rising tide began to lift most of the boats in August of 1994. Uh, wages in America had fallen from 13.78 an hour all the way down to 11.74 an hour from July of 73 to August of 94. And then it turned around and began to rise. Now, interestingly enough, I spoke to you, or this audience, uh, in January of 1996. And I did not know that the prices had turned around. That's because it takes about 24 months for all the data to come in and be massaged to tell us exactly how well the economy performed. Indeed, that's one of the problems of e economics. Uh, it is not possible to forecast economic performance until 18 months after it's occurred. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why they call it the dismal science. But, but in fact, the economy has turned around. Wages were 11.98 an hour by the end of 96. Today in America, the average wage is 12.92 an hour. The last time we were making 12.92 as an average wage in this country was 1979, 20 years ago. We have come back up out of a 20-year hole in just four years without inflation. It has been a superlative a spectacular economic performance that has been so good that none of the major economists in America believed it could be true. For four straight years, they have underestimated how well the economy will perform. Well, it worked all right last year, okay, but they can't possibly keep it up. Oh, look, it kept it up again. Well, two years in a row is all, oh, there it goes a third, and now a fourth year. For four straight years, the economy has substantially outstripped all economic performances, and not just in general, but in fact, in its specific performance criteria, look at this, uh, unemployment steadily, steadily downward, wages rising nicely, uh, inflation plunging. In the last 18 months, the average wage in America went up 4.5%, and average prices rose less than 1.5%. Wages went up three times faster than prices. How do you do that in a free market economy? There's only one way you can do that. Productivity must be going up again. Indeed, it absolutely is. 
It's going up fast enough that the average worker is adding enough more value that you can pay the average worker a higher wage, still make a good profit, and keep the product cheap enough that everybody can buy it. That is magic. That is unambiguously unalloyed good news. And in fact, why is productivity going up? Well, the conventional explanation is, well, it's technology. Oh, give me a break. We have been pouring technology into the marketplace for 15 years, and it didn't improve. Well, yes, the conventional wisdom says this is true. Technology has been entering the workforce for some years now, but we are just now getting to the point on the learning curve where it's finally being used effectively by a wide array of people. Oh, a national learning curve. What, that, that makes sense, yes. Well, and there's another aspect to it. They said until training caught up, many workers were unable to use new technology effectively. Ah, well, what took training so long to catch up? Well, that was a self-inflicted wound. Back in 1981, when Congress put the supply side incentives to buy all this technology in the tax code, they reduced the corporate tax burden to the point that they said, whoa, this is politically untenable. The public will be outraged. Essentially, most big corporations won't pay a dime in tax. And besides, there won't be enough money to run the government. So we're going to have to find some way to raise more revenue. Oh, they went to the Reagan White House and they said, are you kidding? No increase in tax rates anywhere. Okay, the only other thing we can do is to eliminate some tax expenses, deductibility. Oh, let's take out the deductibility of training. And so for 10 years, the tax code gave huge incentives for people to go out and buy lots of technology and no incentive to train people on how to use it. Well, in 1991, the supply side provisions of the tax code came up for renewal, and the economists all came to Washington to testify, and they said, listen, this has been a disaster. It a rate on the Treasury more than $2 trillion of additional national debt that we wouldn't have had, and look, for what? Productivity hasn't budged. This was a dumb idea. Let's strike those provisions. And Congress said, yep, you're right. Let's strike those. But one other thing, said the economists, they said, a lot of labor unions have come and complained to us that management has been pouring new technology into the marketplace and expecting an improved performance without spending a nickel on training and requiring the workers to spend it instead. And we think it would be good if you restored the tax deductibility of training. And Congress said, yeah, that makes sense to us. And they put it in place. And from 1992, when the total expenditure on training by private corporate America was 30 billion, in four years it was 60 billion. They doubled the amount spent on training, made training one of the fastest growing industries in America, and contributed to our finally being able to get some yield out of this technology. In fact, so much yield that in the fall of 97, Mr. Greenspan went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and said, I think that productivity is actually going up faster than you guys are reporting to us, but you're using some outmoded measures. I think we ought to revise the way we calculate productivity and we'll find that it's going up faster than we think. Bureau of Labor Statistics came back in the spring of last year and said, what do you know, Mr. Greenspan was right. Productivity is actually going up half a percent faster than we thought it was. This meant, First of all, that uh, Mr. Greenspan won the bet he had with Alice Rivlin, his number two, over whether or not productivity was going up. And on, uh, it just happened to be April Fool's Day of last year, she coughed up the money, and that led Mr. Greenspan to give an impromptu press conference in which he made the statement that stock prices are justified by the outlook for continued productivity-driven earnings gains. And the market went up a thousand points in the next 60 days. And then it was too fast, collapsed back, and didn't really recover until the last 60, 90 days. I mean, his irrational exuberance, if you will, um, led the stock market to be, but I mean, have you ever seen a picture of the man so happy in your life? <laughs> Now, in fact, to be fair, he had just come back from his honeymoon with Andrea Mitchell at age 71, and Viagra had just been put on the market, so he had a lot to be cheerful about. <laughs> now, whether or not his exuberance was irrational, the increase in productivity is not only not irrational, it's absolutely crystal clear. It's happening, and it's happening quarter after quarter after quarter. And because the productivity is going up, the number of new good jobs is going up faster than it was predicted. Uh, so that, in fact, we got more and more high-value jobs. And, oh, yes, it's true, 
In the last six months, we've seen an uptick in layoffs as international mergers and deregulation continue to foster consolidation in the marketplace. But unlike the layoffs of the preceding 15 years, the economy is generating so many new middle and upper income jobs that the average wage and the unemployment rate both remain entirely acceptable in spite of the fact we're laying off masses of people. I mean, the Labor De Department keeps track of all this and they tell us, yeah, it's true, layoffs are up, but the new economy is generating high paying jobs and will continue to do so faster than low paying jobs for the foreseeable future. During the next 10 years, 60% of new jobs will offer above average wages. It is spectacular. Well, that's all good news, yes, but when we look at the continuing layoffs and the continuing increases, we now are reminded that the economic historians call moments like this waves of creative destruction. And as economists say in a sort of a cold, flat, unemotional way, well, all those layoffs, all those terminated people are merely the social cost of economic progress. Well, conceivably so, but these brutal events have had terrible effects on society. The soaring murder rates, the soaring drug abuse rates, the soaring uh, divorce rates are in very many uh, dimensions, encouraged by prolonged and hopeless economic outlook. You know, at the beginning of the 1990s, a majority of American Americans polled said that they believed that their children would live less prosperous lives than they had. And indeed, even a survey of the Fortune 30 executives in 1991 asking, what will be the biggest economy in the world by the year 2000? 15 of them said it would be Japan. 10 of them said it would be the unified Europe. Only five of the top 30 corporate executives in America in 1991 believed America would still be number one. So the entire country not only lost economic ground, it lost faith in the future, briefly. So much did it lose faith that it even flirted with populism for just a single session or two of Congress. And then they began to recoil from that as they realized, whoa, we don't wanna go down that road. And by that time, the technology started to increase the performance of the economy, prosperity started to come back, the crime rates plunged for six straight years, divorce rates are falling. Hey, things don't look so bad now. Now that we have gotten on this side of the wave of creative destruction, it's important, by the way, to keep in mind that all the other mature industrial economies are also passing through the creative wave of destruction, and most of them are roughly there. Um, six, seven, eight years behind us, which means they got six, seven, eight years of bad road ahead of them. Uh, they got bad times ahead of them that are already behind us We've been laying off people for 15 years. Europe started its layoffs 36 months ago. Massive layoffs of the type, you know, 80,000 at Daimler-Benz and uh, a German telephone and, uh, um, and uh, that kind of, you know, British gas, 60,000 layoff. Uh, and they're doing it at the same time that they are reforming their social welfare systems and those wonderful social benefits they've always had. They're cutting back on them in order to reduce the cost of European labor so it's competitive in a global marketplace. But that means that you're throwing lots of people that double-digit unemployment in France, double-digit unemployment in uh, Germany. Uh, and that means that there is political unrest and uncertainty and turbulence and the fastest growing parties all over Europe are the fascists. They're the largest party in Austria. They are the dominant party in Belgium. They control most of the local governments and the cities. In, Fran or in Spain, the Falange is back in power for the first time since Francisco Franco. So they're gonna have, as old formal cultures do, a much harder time adapting to change than we have. And it's gonna be nice to have an ocean between us and Europe over the next 10 years. And in fact, it's gonna be nice having an ocean between us and Asia too. Because of course, things in Asia are the same way. They're going through this transformation. Uh, some of the nations, their economies forced massive layoffs to begin with in Thailand and Korea. Japan has resisted and resisted. In fact, it was only at the beginning of this week that for the first time a major 
prosperous Sony corpora uh, Japanese corporation, Sony, announced a major layoff of 18,000 people. And when they did that, the Nikkei went up 2.4%. They said, at last, someone who recognized the handwriting on the wall. The, the Japanese government still has not come to grips with this. Um, so, but the good news is that Thailand seems to have turned the corner. Uh, they've had two straight quarters of economic growth after eight years, of, uh, eight quarters of shrinkage. Uh, it looks like the uh, Korea is about to bottom out. So those countries that have seriously addressed the needs for reform in their banking systems uh, have done so, have begun to come out of the hole. Still, there's some big uncertainties out there. I, I mean, I wouldn't deny that for the minute. Um, not, and not just in the free market countries. Uh, in China, for example, in the last 12 months, a million state workers have been laid off of national enterprises. Um, and they don't have unemployment insurance in Japan, uh, in China. Uh, all they were able to tell these people is that, hey, good news, everybody. We have been adopted the free market system. You can go out and start your own business. Goodbye. Um, so, you know, there's going to be turbulence and unrest there, and that troubles people. Because they say, look, I know that things are certainly going pretty well in the United States, but can we reasonably, plausibly expect to remain prosperous when the rest of the world is all going to hell in a handbag? Well, this is an important thing to pay a little attention to. Uh, all of the economists tell us that if we continue to increase productivity as we're doing now, we really don't have to worry about the world economy dumping us down the tubes. Why is that? Well, they said, you know, we only trade about 15% of our gross domestic product into the international marketplace, which me and we are the world's largest economy. So in fact, it's really a very small piece of our total enterprise. Who generates most of our marketplace demand? Why, the world's biggest and most prosperous consumer population. That's who. $2.6 trillion worth of sales a year. And as long as they stay prosperous and continue to buy, this economy will roll and it'll just benefit off the fringe of this uh, sales abroad. Now, for most other industrial economies, they trade 30 to 40 percent of their output in the international marketplace. For them, international trade is lifeblood. It's at the heart of their prosperity. For us, it is not. Well, that is not fair to say. For us in the United States as a whole, it is not. Now, in, on the coasts, is quite different. And, and, and for instance, here uh, in the Pacific Northwest, in Oregon, the, the Asia uh, problems uh, weigh about twice as heavily. That is to say, the West Coast is about twice as intensively engaged in international trade as the country as a whole. But between 10 and 15 percent of the local economy is traded in the international marketplace. But even there, a recent survey of local economists and the economists for the local major industries like the electronics and timber industry said, when pressed, yes, actually, as long as the U.S. economy stays robust, uh, Oregon is going to be okay. By the way, I used these transparencies this morning when I was lecturing at Cleveland High School to the high school students, and after it was all over, um, a couple of them came up and they said, wow, we can't believe that you live in Washington and you uh, read the Oregonian? And you, I mean, is it that important to travel? I said, well, actually, the Oregonian and the Register Guard are two of the best papers in the United States. But beyond that, no, and on all honesty, I don't sit down and read the Oregonian every day, but uh, a member of our organization, our family does, and that's my mother, who happens to be here this evening. She lives in Eugene, along with many of my family. Now, she's not a native, she's a Hoosier, but she's been out here uh, about 30 of her 90 years, and so regards herself at least as an honest transplant, and so she can read the Northwestern news and feed to our organization in Washington what's going on. Uh, and not only that, but she also does book reviews. Uh, this is a measure of just how important it is, the phrase, use it or lose it. If you continue to be cerebrally active, you will stay young. And that's the youngest 90-year-old in the world sitting right over there in the front of the... <laughs> now, uh, we say, okay, uh, if the U.S. economy stays robust, then we're in good shape. And what's more, we're tracking 
the performance of the rest of the world's economy very closely. Uh, Greenspan really is now serving as the Federal Reserve Chairman for the global economy, not just our economy. And here the Argentines just recently said, he's doing such a good job, we're going to quit issuing our own currency, we're going to use U.S. dollars. And we just sent a bunch of guys down there to say, wait, 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 wait a minute, guys. <laughs> uh, let's think about this. It might be a good idea, but let's not be too quick about that. Um, so, in fact, uh, you know, we are now the dominant economy, just like we're the dominant uh, 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 military power. So we're going to be the world's policeman. We're also the world's banker. It's not easy being the world's greatest power. We have a lot of responsibility, and we can't avoid it. But... Because we have a responsible fiscal leadership in this country, uh, and the team is a pretty quality bunch of folks, that they are attentive to this, and uh, these kinds of turbulence in international markets are not going to catch us by surprise. We are discounting those things. The investors and the big fund managers are discounting them. We pulled back from the uh, investments in the international marketplace over the last uh, 36 months. That's pretty good. So the question is, uh, are there any other possible unanticipated shocks? out there that could upset our apple cart. Well, yeah, in fact, there is one that everyone is worried about, and that is the Y2K problem. So how big a problem is this? Well, now, Y2K has been a frustrating problem for those of us in the futures business, right? Uh, because uh, here was an event that was going to happen in the future for certain, and we've known it for decades. And we would go to management. I was the first chief of information systems of IRS back in 1969. And one of the first reports I made when I got that job was uh, to the commissioner saying, by the way, there is this interesting problem we have that uh, when the, we get to the year 2000, the computers are not likely to be able to process and they might lock up and, and we need to think about that. And the response was, uh, when was this going to be a problem? In the year 2000. 31 years from now? Come back a little later, please. We live in a short-term world. Besides, they said, we'll have a brand new computer system by then, and we'll have all taken care of that. Well, I left IRS in 1982 as the chief of long-range planning, and uh, as I left, the last report I submitted to the commissioner at that time was, oh, by the way, uh, the problem that we started to worry about back in 1969 is still there. We haven't really changed, and although there were various efforts to replace the computer system, it became politically untenable in Watergate to improve the computers of IRS, so we actually are still running with the 1960 system in place, and therefore, this is a problem we need to look at, and the commissioner at that time said, oh, you're probably right. Now, when is this going to be a problem? Uh, 2000. Oh, gee, 18 years from now? Come on. Besides, we'll have a new computer system by then. <laughs> well, here we are. It's 1999. The IRS is running on essentially the same computer system that I installed for them back in the 1960s. A very robust system, but getting toward the end of its service life. <laughs> um, there's only one company in the world still makes vacuum tubes for it, and there's only... And there's only three of us that still buy them. The Internal Revenue Service, the FAA, because their air traffic control computer is an Asperger Univac 8300, and the Russian military. <laughs> and the plant that makes them is in Warsaw, Poland. So, and they've said, look, we're going to shut this factory down. We're not making enough money off of it. So we are under some compunction to move pretty quickly to replace those computers. Now, in fact, we owe a debt of gratitude, however much you might not like the media. We owe a debt of gratitude to these guys because the technical people kept going to management and leadership of both the public and private sector for years and years and said we got this problem. And they said, if it isn't a problem in the next quarter, I don't have time to look at it. And, you know, we would have rolled right up to this moment and we still would have had no one doing serious work about the, uh, this problem were it not for the mass media. And here's why. On slow news days, reporters read technical journals to find news to scare the general public with. <laughs> they read medical journals about new plagues. <laughs> they read genetic engineering stuff about mutations that will conquer the world. And they read computer journals and they see, they, what is this year 2000 problem? They go to interview a bunch of people and they say, you know, wow, this is really a problem. And so it was just exactly a year ago that suddenly the mass media broke 
the Y2K story. It was cover story on Time and Business Week and uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal had features on it. And suddenly, American corporate leadership could no longer simply ignore this problem because their board came to the CEOs and said, say, uh, Bill, what are we doing about this uh, year 2000 problem? And Bill said, oh, we were right on top of it. Yeah, we've had guys looking at this for 30 years. <laughs> All right. And then they went back and said, quick, quick, what are we doing about Y2K? Well, there was a lot of panic. Uh, and a lot of resources shifted around. Some people just shut down all their computers, stop and put and everybody fixing Y2K. Um, and in fact, as of January of this year, as management began to realize that, never mind reprogramming the computers and the software, uh, there's only about 250 million of those installed around the United States. The real problem is the embedded chips. There's 36 billion of those in everything out there. There's about 36 microprocessors in a typical luxury car today. Uh, in your microwave, in your, um, in your uh, TV set, VCR, in turbines and generators at power plants. Uh, wow. So, in fact, national coordinating efforts mounted. Uh, people began to look at ways to fix it quickly in way of a program fix like a Norton utility. And uh, other people started to write gloom and doom books. But the current status is, first of all, there are two software packages out there. One that substantially reduces the amount of time required to clean Y2K out of large systems, and another one that will, for 32 bucks from Compact Computer, that will simply clean up the problem altogether for PCs. Uh, in addition, the guys who are tracking this problem are saying it took a little while. We're, we're, we had to you know, play catch-up ball, but America has mobilized in a kind of a warlike footing in its organizations, and most large and medium-sized organizations in the public and private sector have, in fact, come alive on this, and they're in pretty good shape. I have to observe that one of the exceptions to this is Oregon State Government. In a survey conducted by the Gartner Organization in December of last year, Oregon was one of five states who reported that they had actually done nothing on Y2K through the end of last year. I have asked a couple of people in the Oregon State Government why that is, and they have uh, given me various answers like, well, there's no money, uh, there's no time, there's no leadership, but I still haven't quite figured out why uh, you guys ought to be uh, trailing so badly when the state next door, Washington, is one of the 10 best states with over 75 percent in readiness. Um, so you got to pay attention here to what's going on in your state government and ask the, the folks here, you know, well, oh, is there some subtle strategy you've got? Well, it could be. <laughs> It could be, they could, yeah, well, we're going to become a basket case, ask for federal aid, it should work out okay. <laughs> or maybe they've actually started to use all this software. They said, if we wait long enough, somebody will come up with a single thing we can do that only costs $1.99 and it cleans it all up. In fact, uh, there are some people who have run their computers past the year 2000, just run the calendar forward to see what happens, and guess what? Nothing happens. In fact, most computers, including little 286 chip machines, will update to the year 2000 with no problem. Uh, and then they begin to malfunction in little strange ways, like they have a sleeping virus in them. But as I say, a compact computer will sell you a little program fix for 32 bucks. Now, even though things are pretty good in the United States, and Social Security said, hey, the, the, the checks will keep flowing. Social Security is clean. Uh, the US military says, yep, we're going to the year 2000. We're going to be okay. Um, uh, all the nuclear power plants in the United States have reported themselves clean. On the other hand, in the rest of the world, uh, this problem has hardly been addressed. And while most of the rest of the world is not nearly computer dependent as we are, there are some serious problems overseas. Uh, to begin with, in Europe, where you would have thought, well, those guys are pretty sophisticated, they'll be on top of this. Yeah, the problem is, that most of the computer focus in Europe has been directed toward the Euro monetary conversion and they postponed all the work on Y2K until early this month. Oh, so they're really playing catch up ball. Yes, and there's another problem. You know, they're trying to integrate uh, all the nations of Europe to be one nation. A laudable thing that we all hope for, but they haven't got the hang of it yet. Notice, 
uh, Netherlands, which has cleaned Y2K out of its power grid and power generation systems, um, has announced that it will cut off its power grid to the rest of Europe in order to protect its domestic power distribution from external problems. No, 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 guys. When you're part of a single country, you help one another. You don't set up you know, barriers at the border. Um, then there is uh, Asia. Uh, the Asian computer programmers and people have been dealing mostly with the turbulence caused by the banking crisis and the economic crisis. Meanwhile, substantial reductions in corporate discretionary funds, as well as government funds, have all led to the fact that very little has been done in Asia. Now, the Chinese say, yes, it's true, very little has been done, but we have so few computers that it really won't make any difference for us. Uh, but this is not true of Japan. Uh, although they should be able to make it through pretty well. The countries that will become basket cases for the family of nations are Russia and the Ukraine. First of all, if you're keeping track on how well those outfits are running right now, you understand that they're only barely uh, keeping upright. I mean, they're very close to falling down. You know what the total budget is for the entire Russian government this year? $23 billion. $23 billion? The budget for New York City is bigger than that. This is for the whole of the Soviet Union, old Soviet Union, $23 billion. So they have no money to spend on anything. Uh, you know, the, the, what, the troops haven't been paid for eight months. Most civil servants haven't been paid for 12 months. The coal miners haven't been paid for 18 months. Uh, there is not enough food, there's not enough heat. The average temperature in a Russian house is under 50 this winter. Uh, and in fact, in many places, there's no heat at all. And with the shortages of food and uh, other and heat and other energy, uh, what happens? Y2K occurs when? January 1st in the middle of the winter. So the expectation is that they are likely to experience serious power outages, including some, if not all, of their nuclear reactors shutting down, some of which are Chernobyl-style machines. Um, in fact, the Russians uh, came to the United States last month and asked if we would give them $3 billion just to fix the Y2K problems in their military computers, pointing out that a malfunction in one of their military computers, in fact, would pose some problems for the United States. <laughs> now, they're very quick to say that there are no problems in their ballistic missiles. Oh, you mean they'll work all right? Yes, the ballistic missiles will work all right. But the early warning systems may malfunction and give us, you know, bad readings and so forth. Well, frankly, here, the U.S. President, Mr. Clinton, is sitting on a budget surplus that is variously estimated at $75 billion to $175 billion cash. Give them the money. It's money well spent. Uh, you know, come on, guys. <laughs> Let's be big about this. But as far as America is concerned, the bottom line on Y2K is nothing but a speed bump on the way to paradise. And that paradise is the 21st century and how well this economy is about to take off. Indeed, uh, this is the cover of a book by Bob Davis and Dave Wessel, two Wall Street Journal reporters, and they've taken the data from that Stanford report that I quoted earlier and my, uh, the book that my partner and I wrote, America in the 90s, and they said, look, these two theoreticians said that the economy would begin to perform well about now because of these reasons. They said, we're going to go back and see whether or not the reasons why things are going well is because of the maturing of the technology, or is it more like a demographic reality? All the baby boomers have reached their maximum earning years, and therefore, we're prosperous. Well, that wouldn't add anything to productivity. And the fact of the matter is that what Davis and Wessel found was it's an exact image of what happened in the electromechanical, the same benchmark stages, the same important functions, and they're happening at about the same pace. They said from uh, the shrinkage of the technology, the first electric appliances were enormous dynamos, which they used to replace great big steam engines in all the factories. Um, and then little by little, over 60, 50, 60 years, they went from huge dynamos to little tiny electric motors that you could put into individual machines that workers worked with. And when that finally happened, oh, productivity took off. Another problem was you had to have an infrastructure before the technology was useful. Uh, most of electric appliances we use in the household today were invented in the 19th century. The electric vacuum cleaner, the electric clothes washing machine, the electric iron, the electric sewing machine, but nobody bought them. Nobody had any electricity. 
right? We had to build a whole bunch of power plants and string high tension lines across the countryside and down every street and into every home, and then there was a market. But that was 40 years after Edison started to sell electricity in the marketplace in London and in New York. And so you have to have an infrastructure. Well, we got the electronic infrastructure. Do we have an infrastructure for the information age? You bet. The infrastructure, the internet. And what about the computer? Yeah, has it shrunk from something in a room 30 by 50 feet that weighs 30 tons? Sure. In fact, the current generation of new breakthrough information technology uh, threatens to eliminate the one that we've all become familiar with in the last 10 years, the PC. There are some people who say the PC, a temporary phenomenon, like the Model T in the early stages of the car era. Uh, we're going to replace the PC with the PDA, the Personal Digital Assistant, the first one of which went on sale in January. The Personal Digital Assistant combines the pager, the cell phone, and the Palm Pilot, and the expensive models include a digital video camera. This is the universal tool of the information age. This will be the automobile of the information age. Everybody will have one. It's the means by which we will communicate most of the time. Uh, the PDA is already replacing PCs in the workplace. The sales of PDAs are shooting up. They will pass the sales of PCs in less than five years. Um, this is going to be the ubiquitous tool that we will all have, wear on our belt. Um, and already we've got the infrastructure set up for this. Um, the big phone companies set up video messaging systems in August of last year. In January of this year, the integrated unified messaging system that permits you to send voicemail, email, faxes, and video to a single phone number has now been offered in the marketplace. And in order for this to work worldwide round, a telecommunications revolution is going on above our head even as we sit here. Three separate satellite cell phone systems, high speed, high density systems under construction uh, up above us. We don't hear a lot about it over here because in fact the people building them are, are using the much cheaper launch facilities in China and uh, Russia than here. But if we paid attention to that, every week a satellite goes up either from uh, Baikal or Lopnor carrying eight communication satellites for Bill Gates. Uh, for example. So that revolution is well underway. We're going to wire the world. The infosphere will blanket the world and permit us to communicate uh, everywhere. It will be a wired global village and just in time because, of course, we have reached this moment of a boundless global economy. With the GATT and the trade agreements, yes, the balance of trade is still out of kilter. We got a highest uh, trade deficit since uh, 1987. Uh, but that's because the other countries of the world are still going through their transition. Once they get up and stabilized again, we will have a wonderful global economy with equivalent and competitive economies specializing in the things they are most competent at. That will mean that inflation will continue to be worldwide. And in the midst of all this, by golly, not only was the 20th century the American century, but it looks like the 21st century is going to be the American century too. Uh, now, is this hubris uh, or is this a legitimate statement? Are we just being chauvinistic by saying, oh, the Americans, the Americans, the Americans are best? Or is there some substance behind the kind of cheerful editorials that we are seeing recently by guys like uh, Mort Zuckerman saying, uh, let us count the way that America is triumphant in the new world economy. The United States uniquely possesses the fundamentals of a post-industrial boom economy. What is that all about? What that's all about is the third revelation of the economic historians. You remember the first revelation was, uh, this takes 75 years. And the second revelation was, during the first 50 of that 75 years, the economy actually performs less well and people in general are less prosperous. And the third revelation is, seven-eighths of the beneficial impact of a new technology arrive two-thirds of the rate through the transition all at once. 
all the things they have promised us all these years that this technology is going to do for us, it will now do in the next five to ten years. An avalanche of innovation into the workplace and our homes, enriching and complicating everything we do. It's going to be great. I mean, back in 1956, John D. Bold promised us a cashless society. A cashless society. What a joke. What did they do? Ooh, they installed 167,000 ATMs all over the country. And what do we use them for? To get cash, right? All right. In fact, we know that because every transaction at an ATM is recorded. And the average says, no matter what else they do when they go to their ATM, the average American walks away from the ATM with $60 more cash in their pocket than they walked up to the ATM with. As a result, we're all of us sitting here in this room tonight, more than likely with wads of $20 bills in our pockets. And everywhere you got changed for a 20, uh, no, I just came from the money machine, all I have is 20s. <laughs> if you fly anywhere, you know, the, the stewardess is going up and down, who's got changed for 20s? We got three 20s here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, all I got is 20s. They made us a cash full society, not a cashless society. And what else did they promise? Oh yeah, Norb Wiener said back in 1955 that we were gonna have paperless offices. Uh, let's see my hands, please. How many paperless offices do we have here in the house, right? Right. Well, it's about to happen very fast. Watch how fast. In uh, 1991, a survey of the Fortune 100 companies asking, how do you communicate with your employees, found that 66% said we use paper. By 1994, it was 57% using paper. By 97, it was down to 42% using paper. Meanwhile, who were using electronic mail to communicate with their employees? 6% in 91, almost all of them computer companies. It was part of their culture. By 94, it was 20%. By 97, it was 41%. And now, last year's surveys all tell us that about two-thirds of the Fortune 500 companies communicate with their employees by means of email. And of those, one-third say that it is the primary or only way that they communicate with their employees. Uh, and indeed, uh, what do they say they're getting out of it? Well, well the executive survey say that uh, email has cut back on the need for business meetings. Uh, nine out of 10 executives say it's reduced the need for paper correspondence and improved overall productivity. Now, having said all that, does that mean that now that we have this new email technology in all of our offices, that we will immediately become more productive? Absolutely not. First, we'll have to learn exactly how to use this, and anybody who's been living with uh, immature email knows that it is not yet an ideal medium, all right? For example, managers don't know how to use it. Uh, many managers subject employees to Friday afternoon dumps, assignments via email that arrive minutes before the workers go home on the weekend. You can just see the little pointy-haired boss character in Dilbert doing that, right? Except, of course, he can't do that because the employees gave him an Etch-a-Sketch for a laptop because they don't trust him, you know, to have... How do I reboot this again? Oh, yeah. I remember now. Even worse, many managers use email to send performance reviews and other sensitive documents. I know two people who receive termination notices electronically. Oh, that's cold. So what we haven't figured out yet, is email a uh, e-message like a written letter or inter-office memorandum with all the weight and formal communication? Or is it more like an offhand remark or a phone call? We've learned some things. We've learned that criticism and sarcasm do not come across well in email. Don't try it. You're going to get in big trouble. What I meant was, never mind. I don't want to hear about it. Uh, on the other hand, we also understand that managers who shun email immediately are out of the loop. They're immediately losing ground. So even though we may not like it, we got to get it, and we don't like it. Most managers say, it's too much of a good thing. I get 80 emails a day, and 60 of them are because I'm copied from multiple levels, and the address block is so complicated, I can't tell whether it's one or the other. In fact, wait a minute, these are three messages I sent this morning being sent back to me. Uh, we got to streamline this, right? We got to make it work better. But even as employers are struggling with uh, st uh, making use of this very powerful tool in an efficient way, and they'll do it. Over the next three, four, five years, we'll figure out all the protocols. We'll get the address box down. They're very simple. Uh, we'll have protocols on what you do in email and cyberspace and what you do in writing, uh, and everything will be fine. But the impact on society, the tangible effect on everyday life 
uh, will not be nearly so great within our institutions as outside our institutions. In fact, the most powerful force for change, more powerful than any government initiative or than anything that corporate leadership could possibly do, is when a mass market reaches consensus about what's a good thing to do. And when that happens, you've got to stand back and just look out. And that is what has happened in America in the last five, six, seven years with regard to the Internet. Now, in 1990, there were four million Americans on the Internet, uh, mostly young males, high on testosterone, looking for sex, violence, and aggressive intellectual interaction. Uh, by 1994, there were 14 million Americans on the Internet, and they still were mostly dominated by young males. But in December of 94, the Internet became the web. Graphic and color became added to a textual system, and since that time, uh, use has exploded. Today, over 70 million American adults are online every day, more than a third of all the adults. Uh, among the next generation, the college students, 92% say they are online, two-thirds of them every day by four or five messages. And the high school students, here's a survey that tells us that um, if you had a choice, how would you prefer to conduct research for a school report? A, a statistically represented survey of high school students across America, 77% said internet, 22% said books or magazines. I mean, the next generation has already made themselves quite at home in cyberspace. In fact, if you represent an organization that's trying to recruit college students, uh, don't send them a recruitment package in the mail that doesn't have a URL on it. They'll just throw it in the wastebasket. They don't want to be associated with any loser that hasn't already established a presence on the web. Uh, I mean, they just don't want to deal with people in any other way. It's, in their minds, so inefficient to communicate any other way than by cyber mail. And in fact, now that there are 70 plus million Americans online, the cross-section of the membership is much more a cross-section of the American public. Next month, the number of women online will pass the number of men online for the first time. By fall, the number of foreign uh, sources online will pass the number of American online for the first time. Now the question is, okay, there's millions of people online, what the hell are they doing online? Well, in fact, at any given moment, 30% of the people on internet are either sending or receiving email. It's straightforward. The next most common use, 72% of internet users say they use the internet to gather information on products or services before they make a purchase. Oh, an online consumer's report. Absolutely. Makes it easier to shop and all the rest of that. 30% of internet users say they use the internet to communicate with a vendor from whom they have purchased a good or service in order to complain about it or to ask questions and clarification or to ask for supplies or support. In fact, we find that about 75% of all the retail products sold in America, I'm sorry, 85% of all the retail products sold in America have an 800 number on it so that you can call up the people and say, well, there was bugs in my candy bar or whatever. Um, uh, now, 15% of all those products have a fax number on them. And uh, between 5 and 7% of all retail products sold in America have a uh, internet or a web address on them. What they have found is that as soon as you put a web address on a product, the use of the 800 number and the fax vanishes. People prefer to communicate by the internet because, hey, I can send visual material, photographs in color. This is what it looked like when I opened the box. Uh, or, look, here's a photocopy of the instructions. Can you make any sense out of them? I certainly can. Now, not only are commercial enterprises uh, uh, working closely with the buyers, their consumers, but in fact, uh, politicians are using the internet to work more closely with their constituents. Last year was the first year in which essentially every candidate for public office in America had a website.
and it was used to mobilize volunteers, to poll uh, uh, constituents to find out uh, what their opinions were, uh, to raise money, etc. Uh, this is going to change the face of American politics. Certainly, you can look down the road, especially in a state like Oregon, where you've got mail-in ballots and say, hey, it's only one step away to making the whole thing electronic. And, of course, once it's all electronic and getting people elected, now you have a new website called E the People. So that if you get pissed off at City Hall, you call up E the People, www.ethepeople.com. And uh, you say, um, I am upset with the behavior of the mayor of uh, Gold Beach, Oregon. I hope he's not here tonight. I don't mean to insult him. It just came up that way. Um, and this thing will come back and say, OK, here is the phone numbers and address of the two state senators, the congressman representing that district. Um, here is the state inspector general's office phone number in case you want to lodge a, um, a real criminal complaint against this guy. Here's a list of the investigative reporters who cover this area and would love to get dirt on any government agency in the three county area and if you want to set up a website to mobilize other people who are equally unhappy about the egregious behavior of your local government we'll help you do that oh it's not going to be fun being a politician now that we got cyberspace i'll tell you and what else are they doing on the internet hey this is striking um people are getting jobs on the internet in fact it is rapidly becoming the principal standard a way to find a new job in America. A recent survey of American Management Association of its 8,000 members found 70% of them recruited their employees now over the internet. A survey by Challenger Gray and Christmas says 30% of all the executives recruited last year were recruited over the internet. It is the new job market. Uh, and if you're looking for a new job in this tight labor market and you get responses saying, yeah, we are looking for programmers, all right, but you don't have hypertext programming skill, which is what I'm looking for. Oh, gosh, where can I get that new skill. Ooh, on the internet. Boy, there are nearly a million people taking at least one accredited post-secondary course on the internet, and it's just going to grow. And of course, while people are running around trying to find new uh, employment, uh, taking courses on the internet, probably uh, taking care of a family in some course, you're going to be stressed. And in, in America today, stress is the principal source of disease. And if I get sick, where will I get well? On the internet. There are now a growing number of just diagnostic sites where you can call up and you say, like, oh, I'm a white male, uh, age 60, I weigh this amount of uh, money, I don't have any chronic problems, but here are my symptoms. And you give them the symptoms, and almost immediately comes back a probability assessment of what you got. Well, uh, there's an 81% probability that you have the common cold. Uh, and here are the things across the counter that, according to our market research, seems to provide most people with the best relief from the symptoms of common cold. On the other hand, there is an 11% chance that the symptoms you describe could be this, for which you'll need to see a doctor. Now, what kind of doctor you want to see? General practitioner or specialist? You want to have a male doctor or a female doctor? Do you want to have an alternative medicine, herbalist? Uh, chiropractor, acupuncture, uh, crystals, the laying ons of hands, you know. And in fact, once you get a doctor on here, they will treat and prescribe for you over the uh, internet. Uh, something that upsets a number of medical societies uh, because some people are doing this across state line. Uh, well, this is a revolutionary tool. We're going to see all kinds of revolutionary things. And of course, if I seek medical care on the internet and I fail to fulfill my wellness potential, that is to say, I die. <laughs> um, where will I be memorialized? Increasingly, I will be memorialized on the web. In fact, it makes a lot of sense. How many of us still live in the town we grew up in? I certainly don't, and most people I know don't. Yeah, there's a family plot back in Indianapolis, but there's nobody to go visit it anyway. Why would I want to get myself buried there? Indeed, in fact, more and more Americans are having themselves, uh, you know, incinerated and uh, put in a little urn. And then because nobody knows quite what to do with the little urn, uh, uh, families now end up with little collections of little urns sitting in closets and places like this. So we have to deal with that in some fashion. But the memorial service, that's another story. More and more people, when a relative dies, are going up online and putting up a little memorial site. And they say, Eugene Tidwell of Hutchison, Kansas has died.
Uh, anybody who knew Eugene during his lifetime, any of the guys that served with him in Korea, anybody who were with him at the ag school before that, if you got stories about uh, Eugene, if you got pictures of Eugene back then, send them to us. And after, you know, 30, 45 days, you got enough data, you dump it onto a CD-ROM, you have a wonderful memorial. Uh, and you've also let a lot of people know that Eugene has passed on who would probably never have known that. Um, and in a very real sense, this is a, a sound and reasonable memorial in an information age. Well, of course, now death is one of the great necessities of life, right? Death and taxes. And taxes, of course, you can pay on the internet. In fact, this year, for the first time, six million Americans will pay their income tax from their home personal computer direct in addition to 30 million Americans who will pay electronically through a third party. And in fact, all sorts of financial activities are going online. Everything that have to do with money and banking, we're going to do online. Not only banking, but in fact, insurance. The nation's life and fire and casualty insurance companies are rubbing their hands and salivating. They're going to sell insurance direct to Americans and get rid of 250,000 insurance agents over the next five years. Uh, in the stockbroking market, 150,000 stockbrokers are expected to lose their jobs over the next five years as more and more Americans do their own research on stocks, buy their own stocks, manage that all themselves. One of the most astonishing revolutions is in the realty industry. If I'm living in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, I get transferred by my agency, and they say, well, now you're going to have to work in Denver. Well, what do I do? I sit down and I can call up the Denver uh, retail uh, uh, realty listings. I can see all the houses for sale, a little picture, and here's the description. In some parts of the country, Dallas and Houston and New Orleans, for example, uh, they permit you to actually take a tour of the house. You walk through a little video tour. This is what it looks like. And here's a little uh, quick tour of the neighborhood, what it's like. Now, that's not all I can do. After I've looked at it and there's the price, I can call up and from three or four different independent surveyors, I can get an up-to-date assessment of that house, an appraisal, and in addition, a market research that says, here's what other houses of that size in this neighborhood have sold for in the last six months. Now I know what a fair price of this house is, and I can get a mortgage lined up online very quickly from a number of operators, 24 hours a day. Then I go to the realtor on the internet, all of this is, and I say, uh, listen, I've looked at this house you've got for sale, and I like it, but I'm going to offer you 20000 less than the asking price, and I've already checked with three appraisers. That's higher than it's really worth, and I've got my mortgage loan lined up, so take it or leave it. And there are a lot of realtors now just leaving the realty business. They say, I can't deal with this. There's no schmoozing. There's no interaction or nothing. The customer comes to me. It's a done deal. In fact, we're not only shopping for houses in cyberspace, we're shopping for everything in cyberspace. And retail sales in cyberspace doubling every year, except last year when they tripled. Uh, and it might be accelerating. But in any event, somewhere between eight and $10 billion worth of retail, retail trade last year versus uh, two, two and a half trillion dollar, billion dollars worth of retail trade the, the year before that. This year, they're expecting it to be 20 billion to 30 billion. And the year after that, it'll be 60 billion, which means it'll be equivalent to uh, catalog sales. And that poses a problem because in most states, retail sales tax is a source of half of all the state's revenue. Not here, I understand, but most places. And uh, so they're saying, wait a minute. We didn't mind when people sold $60 billion worth of goods over catalogs. We know that the law is flouted. The law, of course, requires you, the recipient of anything you buy in a catalog from out of state, to sit down and dutifully fill out a little check and pay the state where you ordered this from for the sales tax. Um, the best estimates we have is that 0.000015 of all Americans do this. Uh, so there's been, by the way, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of sales tax over the last 50 years which have not been collected. Well, in fact, the, so the state said, now wait a minute, we, we, we exempted the catalog sales, but we can't afford to exempt internet sales as well. We've got to tax this. And Congress came back at the request of all the folks that are building the internet, and they said, no, 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 we've got to have a moratorium. Uh, we've got to like, get more robustly established and kind of get a feel for what this is going to do. So Congress last uh, fall said, okay, moratorium, no taxes on internet sales for three years. 
Uh, but now the sales are clearly accelerating. They're going to get very big. The common forecast is now $300 billion worth of retail sales on the Internet within three, four years. And that represents a big piece of change. Now, how are we going to deal with that? We're going to deal with that with a national sales tax. We can't have all the independent states doing this because the mail order houses will go to the places with the lowest tax rates. And that would cause chaos. So, in fact, that's going to be changing. And then what's happening in America's neighborhoods as the number of sales over the Internet go up? Oh, our residential neighborhoods are filled with UPS and FedEx trucks. Um, except that they're unhappy with that. UPS and FedEx lose money on every residential package they deliver. They hate the business because they have to go back if nobody's there. Or if they leave it between the storm door and the window, there's a new criminal career field out there now of people that start out in the morning trailing every UPS truck that leaves the plant. And they just go around and wait till people stick a package between the storm door and the front door. And then the truck pulls away. They go, you know, pick it up and off they go. So, in fact, uh, UPS is arranged with uh, Kroger and Safeway supermarkets to uh, keep uh, little package drop-off places so they can leave a sticker to say, uh, we tried to deliver a package for you, but uh, you weren't here. So you don't have to go all the way to our depot on the other side of town, just over to the nearest Kroger or the Safeway supermarket. They got it there at a counter, um, which is, you know, here we are building this new uh, way of dealing with this kind of thing. Overall, the sales on the Internet pose such an increased efficiency of distribution that the Commerce Department says if we did not one more innovative thing in our marketplace over the next um, uh, 10 years, the efficiencies of doing transactions over the Internet would be enough to keep us prosperous and to increase productivity at least 3% a year. Now, what are they talking about? Well, they said, for example, General Electric expects to save $500 million over the next two years simply by purchasing $5 billion worth of goods over the Internet that they used to procure with snail mail, multiple copies, procurement, paperwork, etc. Now it's all electronic, perfectly recorded, and the overhead cost is cut by 10%. Now, it would be important to understand that it isn't just big sales that are going on on the Internet, because that really wouldn't affect everybody. The stuff that really affects everybody is the little things on the Internet. For example, you can now print your own postage stamps at home on the Internet. You know, you get a little account from the Postal Service and they entitle you to print your stamps and your, your little laser printer so you don't ever have to go down to the post office to get your uh, meter uh, reloaded or you buy stamps and so forth. Well, it's great. Um, Pepsi-Cola has announced that it's hooking all of its vending machines to the Internet. What's the big deal there? Well, it's great. It says that the individual who manages all these machines will now have a moment-to-moment -moment readout of exactly the status of that machine, how many drinks of what kind have been sold, and over what frequency, over what uh, length of time. Uh, it will tell you the change maker isn't working, uh, the bill reader is spitting back more than the routine 15 percent of the bills, uh, oh, the machine is busted and it's not vending at all. It says you go out there and manage that machine much more closely, don't put the truck into the field until it's necessary, hugely improve the efficiency of those machines. Now, that's not the only thing that's happening on those machines. Uh, over in Finland, they're doing one better. Not only are all the vending machines and the jukeboxes in Finland hooked up to the Internet, but they're also assigned a phone number. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, that says that if you're in Finland, where 50% of all adults have cell phones because the biggest cell phone maker in the world is there, and you don't have any money in your pocket, and you walk up to a vending machine and you say, oh, I need to have a Coke, I need to have, uh, I want to play uh, ABBA. I dial up the vending machine with my cell phone, I punch the number of the selection, I get the Coca-Cola, and I build on my phone bill for the cost. Now we're talking cashless. And I described that system to the California uh, uh, Society of Municipal Facilities Officers two weeks ago and have been inundated for requests of the address for the software. Every city financial officer said, can you imagine? For every tennis court, for every ball diamond, we don't have to have the lights on all the time. 
just, you know, when people want it, they can dial it up on the cell phone. We don't have to collect the money. It's all centralized. And somebody else said, we're going to do that with our parking meters. Can you imagine? No more change to collect, no more malfunctioning meters. Now, that's the kind of innovation that is going to make daily life, everyday life, simpler, quicker, smoother, lower overhead, higher yield. Of course, the cost is that internet use is now doubling every 100 days. I mean, that's genuine exponential growth. You know, you don't encounter exponential growth in real life very often. It's mostly a hypothetical phenomenon. And in fact, when you graph it, it goes straight up and then goes and crashes, which scares us a little bit. Oh, gosh, they're going to they're destroy. They're going to overload the Internet. Um, well, that could be a concern, all right. Um, let's see. Exponential growth has two forms. Uh, both of them are modeled by uh, uh, gold rush boom towns. Uh, the first one is uh, straightforward. Uh, yep, there was only 14 people lived in this valley until uh, Baxter over there stumbled across that gold nugget. Now there's 44,000 people living there and it's 1,400 arrive every single day until the gold pans out and then it's empty. And a lot of people are worried that, oh, internet is just a flash in the pan. And, you know, it's going to be a boom thing, just like um, uh, CBs. Everybody talked about CBs. Everybody had CBs, and then suddenly they didn't have them anymore. Uh, does that seem likely? Is it likely that we will run out of useful information to be put on the Internet? Not really. Well, all right, what's the other model? Ah, that's the Colorado Silver Town model. Uh, they discovered silver boom expansion. In fact, they discovered so much silver in so many silver towns, they produced so much silver that it drove down the price of silver. They collapsed and the towns collapsed. Are we likely to produce so much information that the demand for information will go away? No, because new information always gives somebody a competitive edge, and that means everybody needs to have the information. So that leaves us with only one worry. We're going to overload and destroy this goose that's you know, laying all these golden eggs. And we've already read stories during the last Christmas uh, rush, right? Uh, internet slowed way down uh, when people trying to buy stuff at uh, Amazon. Uh, the, the waiting lines got so long it was quicker to go down to Borders at the mall uh, instead of trying to get it online. And, um, and eBay w just went down. They just glutted. Um, well, you need to know that the same people who conceived of, designed, and implemented Internet One, the U.S. federal government, has conceived of, designed, and implemented the next generation of Internet. It's already up and running, being beta tested. It is 1,000 times faster it is one million times more capacious than the current internet. It permits the simultaneous streaming of data, if necessary, from every single internet site to a single database at once. It permits the transmission in real time, broad spectrum, real speed of three dimensional video and audio. So you can uh, have these immersive experiences. You can sit in caves of data. I mean, it is spectacular. Now, uh, you see, the, the guys who are using this right now is the nation's uh, high-tech uh, computer nerds. These were the guys that had Internet One all of themselves for years and years and years and have been uh, sulking in the corner ever since the great unwashed were let onto the Internet. And, and so the National Science Foundation went to these guys and said, good news, guys. We're going to give you your own Internet, and it's much, much faster. Actually, they don't call it the Internet. The official name of this is the Very High Performance Backbone Network Service, whose, whose acronym pronounces roughly VIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVIVI
uh, internet replacement, also under construction. So there's going to be plenty of Iway, Infobon, uh, Infonet, whatever you want to call it. Now there's just one other issue we have to think about here, and that is, now let's be clear on this point. Uh, yeah, it's clear that, uh, that computing is going to become ubiquitous and we're going to have all this data around, et cetera, but exactly how is it that this is going to enable us to create millions and millions of new middle class jobs of people that are able to use computers and information to add more value? Especially when all the surveys tell us that after 15 years of effort, the schools are producing a product that is essentially no different from what it was when the Carnegie Endowment issued its report, A Nation at Risk, back in 1983. Um, and uh, that troubles a lot of people because, in fact, the most recent reports still tell us that 45% of all U.S. adults are only marginally, if not functionally, illiterate and let alone numerate enough to use numbers. Um, well, in fact, the think tanks of America studied carefully to identify exactly how it was that computers really added value. And after considerable study, they said, the way that computers add most value is to improve the quality of our decisions. Look at that. It's now no longer sticky enough to stay. <laughs> uh, now, not just the decisions of managers, but the decisions of everybody, rank and file, factory worker, farmer, uh, taxi cab driver, parking lot attendant, every decision by everybody made better. Well, people say, now let me get this straight, you're going to actually uh, beef up the education system enough that the average worker is going to be able to be statistically literate, read pie charts and least squares regression analyses and make better decisions. No, 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 no. That's not the way that Frederick Taylor made the mass prosperity of the Industrial Revolution possible. Frederick Taylor looked at industrial work and said, it's badly organized. If we organize industrial work in a systematic way, and we analyze the work to be sure that each task is done in the one best way that it should be done with time and motion studies, we'll make people so efficient that even illiterates will add so much value that we can pay him a middle class wage. And that's exactly what happened. Taylor went to Henry Ford and sold him on the idea of building the River Rouge Works in the Taylorite model of management. And when it was all done, they took illiterates off the streets of Detroit and they were ad able to add value so much that they paid these guys a middle class wage. So the question is, do we know how to do that with computers? And the answer is yes. And the trick is called expert systems. Within five, six years, everyone in this room will routinely use expert systems every day to help you in whatever you do, whether you're a student, to help you find uh, the kind of research sources to do a term paper. If you're a domestic manager, housewife, uh, how to clean spots out of carpets, uh, how to um, um, do any number of important and increasingly complex tasks of domestic management and of course if you're on the job to help you make better decisions uh, example of such an expert system uh, the American Express company equipped its credit authorizers with expert systems with criteria to determine whether or not you would approve a loan requested over the phone uh, the result of using this expert system was the number of loans approved went up 45 percent the numbers of loans defaulting went down 67 percent increased throughput and increased quality. Works just as well with blue collar workers. Watch. If you build a system that shows workers how to do a complex task quickly, you will gain competitive advantage. Ask the folks at Williams Technologies. Uh, Williams Technology, what do they do? Well, it's a little plant in Somerville, South Carolina, where workers take apart, clean and rebuild car and truck transmissions. Now, this is a trick. When you're doing original equipment manufacturing, you know what you're making. The whole assembly line is set up to optimize your ability to make it. We're making Dodge trucks in this plant and you are assembling Dodge truck transmissions. So we have first of all given you all the tools you need. We've given you jigs so that everything can be held firmly and easily. We've given you exploded diagrams and moving pictures of how to assemble these things together. And these guys are going to be real good at assembling those transmissions. But these folks, every transmission that comes down the line is different. 
1976 Ford Fairlane transmission, a 1984 Cadillac Coupe de Ville transmission, a 1956 Willis Wildfire transmission. <laughs> a what? A Willis Wildfire, you remember? No, I don't remember a Willis Wildfire. Wait a minute, Willis, that, that has a, oh wait, I remember, it used to be on the backs of old Jeeps. They were Willis Jeeps. What happened to Willis? Well, it got bought by Nash, who merged with Hudson to make American Motors, who got bought by Chrysler, who have since been purchased by Daimler-Benz. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Uh, well, in fact, when we were engaged in this project, uh, Daimler hadn't entered the picture yet. It was just Chrysler. So we went to Chrysler and said, we need to look at the archives that you picked up when you acquired Willis. What we're looking for is all the original designs of the jigs and the tools used to assemble the transmissions on the wildfire for 1954 through 56, as well as any training manuals, any instructions to repair staff out there in your service organizations, everything you can tell us about how to do this. And we got all that information and we put it along with the same information about every transmission sold in the United States since 1950s on a network with 10 workstations on the factory floor. And with no further training or investment than that, the output of that factory doubled in one year. Uh, all you had to do was to give these otherwise skilled workers better, more accurate information about, oh, to do this thing, here's the order in which you disassemble it. Here's a list of all the tools. They're in the crib, slot 21. Uh, here are the jigs. They're in flat 26. Uh, bingo. And I am able to competently do my job and move on. Even the government is using expert systems to enable the citizens of America to comply with increasingly complex regulation, which may or may not sound to you like a good idea. <laughs> But, I mean, even OSHA, the one agency that people like to hate even more than IRS, right? Because whereas IRS just takes away your money, OSHA comes in and tries to tell you how to do your job. And people hate that more than anything. And, I mean, they got meticulous instructions for everything, including something as small as, let's say, a brew pub. I mean, if I ran a brew pub and we'd opened it up on the first day of March of this year, and we drank up the first 2,000 gallon batch of brew we made, then it was time to brew a new batch of beer. We would have to clean out the beer vat first. And the brew pub owner says, I'll bet that dumb Osher has got some kind of regulation on how to clean out beer vats. Oh, indeed they do. 200 pages of regulations <laughs> on how to clean out a beer vat. So this guy could go down to the government office and get these things and sit down and spend the weekend reading this 200 pages of regulations. Or he could go to the OSHA website. He could go to the confined spaces advisor on that website, which will ask him a set of questions. Can workers bodily enter into the space? Do workers perform work in the space? Was it designed for physically restricted entry? Uh, continuous use, does it have physically restricted entry? The owner is worked through a logic tree in less than 10 minutes without having to read 200 pages of regulation, and then the system pops up the answer. Yes, this tank is a confined space within the meaning of the act. Here, step by step, is how you will comply to be within the law. The purpose of expert systems is to enable us all to make better decisions every time, all the time, uh, in every setting. Expert systems are software that combine the knowledge of best practitioners. <laughs> Gosh, it's just um, uh, Expert systems outperform most practitioners in specific well-defined problem areas because they make fewer common mistakes. Uh, by the way, the average doctor is wrong 30% of the time, right? This is data from the American Medical Association about their own members collected and analyzed by the RAND Corporation. 30% of the prescriptions are either inappropriate or unnecessary. 30% of surgical procedures, inappropriate or unnecessary. Now, because doctors are so inept, we have an entire industry has sprung up called managed care, staffed by a bunch of actuaries and um, epidemiologists who said, look, Doctors refuse to pay attention to the actual outcomes of their treatment. They trust clinical judgment from a handful of doctors in labs rather than their own experience. So here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to use statistical outcomes to shape 
patterns and guidelines for treatment that will, by definition, improve the ultimate outcome on the average of all health care. And that's what they did, and now the doctors are furious because they would not take responsibility for their own decisions. They are now being overseen by the health care police who review everything that they do and require them to equilibrate and equivocate rather than being free to treat the way their intellect tells them they ought to if they were intellectually honest. Here's how this is going to work out. Uh, there's already exists uh, uh, about a dozen very good general purpose diagnostic software packages. Increasingly, the doctors will finally give in and get these things. They have refused to up to now because doctors, first of all, say, hey, if I treat this person and it doesn't turn out all right, who are they going to sue? Not the dumb computer. They're going to sue me, so I don't want to take a chance on that. But the other thing is, mostly, it's because doctors like to play God. And it's no fun to play God if, in fact, the answer comes out of a box of diodes. No, I've got to be able to do this myself. So, but now they're giving in. Uh, they're saying the only other alternative open to us is to join a labor union. I can't stand that idea. So I'm going to get a diagnostic uh, expert system. And when that happens, the quality of American health care will rise. The cost will plunge and managed care will vanish in the face of precision care having been a temporary phenomenon of the shift to the information age. It will be one of the most dramatic uh, evidences that we have actually passed through the revolution and this will be done within 10 years. Now, uh, expert systems are used as automated checklists, they document accepted practice, they avoid liability problems, uh, they will eventually be used for all advanced certification and continuing professional education. Everybody will use expert systems for all kinds of things. There are already big expert systems out there called case-based reasoning systems in which a computer calls on a huge database of experience to solve complex problems. It's currently used in aircraft maintenance, financial risk assessment, insurance underwriting, and management training. And then there will be many more little expert systems called intelligent agents in which spoken commands will prompt computers to research airfares, reserve tickets, and book hotel rooms. Spoken commands, oh yes. Uh, speech replication and voice recognition is about to be standard on all PCs sold in America within two years. And it isn't just speech. Uh, we've done a lot of research and they said, uh, people don't like the idea of talking to computers that sound like machines. They want to talk to a computer that sounds like a person. And when that became apparent, a number of companies started to do research to ask people, if your computer could talk, what would you like it to sound like? And the first response from everybody was, whatever you do, don't make it sound smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's cool. I can feature that. What else would you like? Well, and the overwhelming majority of the people said, and whatever, it oughtn't to be a voice that um, uh, it makes me nervous or tense. It ought to be a voice that inspires confidence and is supportive. So Microsoft is currently working on its first two computer personas, Bullwinkle Moose and Walter Cronkite. Now, uh, Mr. Rogers is working on a personality for people, kids to use, and for high-level testosterone males, Don Rickles is coming up with a persona that has every four-letter word in it you can imagine. So you can swear at it, and it can swear right back to you. In fact, they're going to put speech replication uh, and voice recognition in everything, you know, not just computers. They'll put it into our appliances. Um, I, I've been retained by the Hammaker Schlemmer organization to come up with a vision of the uh, whiz-bang uh, appliances of the 21st century. Hammaker Schlemmer prides itself in having introduced many of the cutting-edge appliances over the past. The first uh, pop-up toaster in 1930, uh, the Waring Blender in 1937, the first steam iron in 1939, uh, the first electric pencil sharpener and the cordless phone. They were all sold through Hemmerker Slammer. So they recently retained me to go back and look and say, well, what, what are the appliances of the future? Oh, it's going to be great. Uh, we're going to put speech replication in all of our appliances. We'll walk down to the kitchen in the morning in the year 2006 and say, good morning, everybody. All the appliances will answer. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> Hello, Toaster. Hello. 
It's a frozen English muffin toaster. I want it done medium. Sure thing. It'll be great. I mean, the appliances won't work any better than they do today, right? You burned it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. You always say that. But at least we'll be able to take all our anger and tension out on our appliances first thing in the morning instead of our loved ones. It'll be great. Some of the other things that we're working on for Amaker Schlemmer beside the talking toaster is a dashboard for your body. It'll give a continuous readout of all your body functions. So when you go jogging, you know what the pulse rate and the blood pressure is and so forth. And you know how to interact with your body. Um, and um, uh, they're going to put sonic brooms, little vibrations in the washing machine, so you use much less water uh, when you wash clothes because uh, sonic vibrations take the dirt out. And, of course, the PDA, the personal digital assistant. But the important thing is people have been worrying about how do I use these little palm tops? The keyboards are so tiny. No, no, no. We're going to be chatting with our computers. We're going to be chatting with all our little cyber buddies. In fact, the father of conversational computing is Ray Kurzweil. And Ray Kurzweil's got a new book out called In the Age of the Spiritual Machines. Uh, and in this book, he says this. Within 10 years, uh, computer personas, now that's very important, not verbal or conversational computers, computer personas will handle most of our routine business work. Uh, booking airplane reservations and hotel rooms and things like that. Within 20 years, he says, uh, computer personalities will be so good at conversation that people will have full, rewarding, interpersonal relationships with their computers. <laughs> now, understand what this means for productivity. It says, all of us are going to be equipped with one or more little chatty cyber buddy that is very knowledgeable in our particular field, and what's more, is programmed to be cooperative, trustworthy, loyal, honest, things that most of your coworkers cannot claim to be. <laughs> and in that situation, we're just going to all of us become vastly more productive. There's one other kind of intelligent software that will become very important as well, and that is simulations. Uh, this is not like an expert system where it deals with one decision situation. Simulations replicate how an entire uh, major system operates. And we need these simulations now because we've made all of our systems and technology so complex. Uh, I don't know how many of you in the audience are old enough to remember buying a car which always came equipped with a toolkit. Right? A little leatherette kit uh, that you opened up and it had uh, one uh, crescent wrench three box wrenches, a Phillips screwdriver, a uh, regular screwdriver, and a ball-peen hammer. I was never clear what you were supposed to do with the ball-peen hammer. And, and that was the assumption that if the car broke down, there's all you needed to fix it. And for a long time, that was exactly all you needed to fix. If you knew how to fix it, boy, lift the hood, there was the motor, there were the limited number of wires going, but now what happens? The car breaks down, you open the hood, where's the motor? Well, it's under there someplace. But I can't even see it. And when you go into the mechanic shop, the mechanic isn't going to work on that motor. He's going to plug a diagnostic computer into it that tells him exactly where to make the surgical incision to remove the one malfunctioning part and put the other one back in. So we need simulations in order to live life in a complex world. Uh, for instance, every uh, nuclear power plant in the United States has a simulation of that particular specific power plant running side by side to the plant itself. So that if the, uh, the, the documentation readouts on the power plant suddenly begin to indicate a problem, beep, 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 uh-oh, before we intervene with the reactor itself, we first intervene with the simulation to be sure that it will work out right. Uh, oh, yeah, I know what the problem is. Weep, 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 weep. Oh, that must not have been the problem. Whew, I'm glad I didn't do that to the reactor. <laughs> I guess you can put too much water in a nuclear reactor after all. Well, in fact, uh, uh, management is going to use all kinds of simulations. Uh, first of all, because they'll make better decisions. And secondly, because they're going to cover management's ass. That, in fact, we can say, uh, I would have done this intuitively, but let me run this through the uh, simulation to see if it works. Uh, in, in laboratories, they're using simulations to permit people to look at thousands of possible chemical combinations uh, to solve a problem, rather than manually having to go through tens or twenties in a laboratory.
um, for manufacturing, to design products to see how well they go through an assembly line and how to simplify them uh, for efficient production. Uh, architecture, uh, urban planning, planning streets and plazas and how public will move across them. Um, marketing, education and training. Uh, perhaps most strikingly, the program that PricewaterhouseCoopers has just designed for Macy's. They've invented a crowd of 3,000 3, synthetic shoppers. And they incorporate the cross sections of, uh, you know, 3,000 real shoppers. And then they lay out um, a, uh, a floor in a department store, Macy's department store. We're going to put uh, notions here, jewelry there, perfume there, women's clothing here. Now we open the doors and we let the 3,000 synthetic shoppers pass through this graph. And then we calculate how many sales we made. Ah, didn't make nearly as many sales as when we had jewelry here, lingerie there, notions there, and they play around with this until they come up with an optimal system. Now, these same systems are being used also to train managers in how to manage situations. And more and more employers are now taking those simulation systems and they are giving them to the local school system. And they're saying, look, here are the systems we use to introduce our new employees to the nature of the particular work we do in our organization. And we think it would be a good idea if young people were introduced to the nitty gritty, nuts and bolts, day to day reality of uh, the world of work. And we suspect that they don't get that now until awfully late in life and it probably uh, results in their not being very well motivated to take their classroom studies in K-12 since the only image they have of what life at work is like is what they learn through television. And as we all understand, the, the image of work on the television is not what you would call realistic. And I don't mean documentaries about careers at work. No, 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 no. I mean every soap opera, every sitcom, every drama on television takes place in the world of work. But they never show anybody doing any work in the world of work, right? There are people going through interpersonal confrontations on the job. There's people going through midlife crisis on the job. There's murders and crimes committed on the job, but there's never any work committed on the job. So as a result, a survey by Educational Testing Service tells us that a majority of high school seniors in America believe work is where you go to live as an adult. And it's better to live at work than, uh, than living at school because they don't pay you to live at school, but they pay you to live at work. It's really great. And you get to meet a lot of other people and uh, it's really fine. But the idea that work will pose problems for which there are no answers in the back of the book and for which you are to use the individual skills that you're learning in school to solve those problems, that is not readily apparent. Many surveys indicate that the average American young person believes that based on what they see on television, adult life is really a piece of cake in America, except for those who obviously work in hospitals or police departments. And there's a lot of death in those two fields. But other than that, it's pretty banal. And we have to disabuse young people of that. And the way to do that, we're going to provide them with all these simulations of daily work life. And the kids love simulations because it's just like a game. Except they begin to realize, well, this game has rules that are no fun. Ah, now you've got the picture. <laughs> now, uh, employers are using simulations for one other thing. They're using it to screen new hires. Uh, the reason for this is, first of all, that the typical criteria that employers use to screen new hires in the past are terrible predictors of how well someone will do on the job. Um, years of education completed, including degrees earned, 10% better than flipping a coin as a predictor of how well you do on the job. Within 10 years of graduating from college, more than half of all Americans are in jobs that bear no relationship to the degree they took. That's how imperfect the job market is. Uh, grade point average, 21% better than flipping a coin. Uh, grade point average only is a predictor of how well you will earn grades in the future. It absolutely is not a predictor of how well you will perform on a job. Uh, on the other hand, a job tryout or an assessment center, oh, like a simulation is an assessment center, 44% more accurate than flipping a coin. In fact, the only thing that's more accurate is an IQ test, but you can't use IQ tests to screen new hires because most of them are culturally and ethnically biased. Um, and so better to have a simulation of a job or a real job tryout, which by the way explains the boom growth in apprenticeships, internships, 
cooperative learning and mentorship. And what's more, a new study just out tells us that all of this uh, collaboration between uh, employers and the school systems is not just civic mindedness. We now have data that says those firms that work with local school systems uh, with programs like tutoring and sponsoring visits and apprenticeships have half the turnover rate as those firms who do not engage in such relationships with the local education system. It's a 50% turnover rate if you don't engage with your local school system. It's a 25% turnover rate if you do. And it's not insignificant that Oregon is the only state in the union that has passed a statewide significant uh, education reform. Uh, it's the only the second of two states that have pursued experiential learning, uh, apprenticeship, internship as a means of education, even though the mammoth body of data tells us the single most effective way to increase uh, the effectiveness of schools and of student achievement is to increase experiential learning, learning in context, whether it's through jobs or through community projects and community service. Today, one-eighth of all the high school students in Oregon are in some kind of an employment setting part of their school day to enable them to understand how what will be expected of them as adults and how their classroom training is to be applied to their real world situations. Um, uh, Wisconsin is the other state. They made it a local option instead of a mandatory state program, but most of the significant large school systems in Wisconsin have programs very similar to what you have here in Oregon. Uh, you should be very proud because eventually the uh, media which is constantly scanning the horizon to look at things to uh, view with alarm and point at with pride, will finally stumble across Oregon's uh, performance. And by the way, important thing, uh, the performance of your students on basic tests, uh, if you look at the average, you say, well, it hasn't changed much. Uh, yeah, that's right, on the average. But in fact, Oregon, since it in undertook this reform, has seen the scores of the lowest third of your students, mostly the urban third, have come up sharply until they are among the best in the nation. So this reform that you are putting in is helping those who need the help the most, the folks that are least able to learn. The folks that are well able to learn that come from households with plenty of books and uh, computers in them, uh, when you put more uh, change and impact, uh, uh, intervene in the education system, uh, normally these guys do all right. They're already articulate, they're already glib, they're already knowledgeable, and you're just helping them move up a little bit. But the guys that are way behind that don't even have a chance to look at a computer, it's when you get them into a workplace setting in which as a natural part of the work, they're told, oh, by the way, let me sit down here, I'm gonna show you how to use a computer for the, to write a letter, etc." Suddenly they know why they're in school. Suddenly there is a sense of hope for them just to be able to be a part of the kind of, of technology that's in the work site. So you guys are doing the right thing. And by the way, the employers are also using temp work as another means of uh, screening new hires. And new hires are using the temp assignments as a way of saying, do I want to work for these guys? Do I want to be in this field? So in many respects, the temp work phenomenon, which now occupies almost one out of four workers, uh, is an important piece of our changing workplace and how the workplace will identify and match people up. And it's becoming more important because now the labor market is tight. All the time the boomers were young adults, there was a surplus of workers. So employers were very sloppy in how they managed their human resources. They didn't really pay much attention to it. If somebody didn't work out right, that was not a problem. There was huge numbers of workers out there. Wages were uh, not uh, pressing upward at all. But now we got a tight labor market. Now in order to get high productivity, you have to be able to use new technology and new ways of doing things. That requires something. And so uh, during the uh, 80s and early 90s, a lot of employers set up uh, very stringent hiring standards. But as the labor market, uh, the labor market has gotten tighter and tighter, a growing number of employers have said, I know he tested positive for drugs twice, but he doesn't have a criminal record. Why don't we uh, hire him? You know, right? 
Now, by the way, if you're, if you're dealing with people that are having to employ that way, you want to be sure that all those kids are equipped with expert systems so they know what the hell they're doing once they're on board. But in fact, most employers, especially those employers uh, who produce high value products and have high value jobs are saying, no, we're not going to hire anybody unless they meet our standards. Because once we make a permanent employee of them, uh, they're a capital investment. We're going to have to pump more and more money into training. Um, we want to keep those people that we hire. And indeed, in order to deal with that, a growing number of firms now are awarding degrees. They've got campuses. Uh, you know, um, uh, Motorola University, um, Microsoft University, uh, Land Rover University. Uh, Land Rover of America has a university at Landover, Maryland. They looked all over to find some place that really scanned nicely. And uh, they teach people communication skills and uh, off-road driving. And uh, since they set this thing up, sales have doubled in the 36 months. Uh, in the Trade and Patent Office, they have a Trade and Patent University. And in any given moment, uh, about one-fifth of all the employees of the Trade and Patent Office in Washington are taking courses at the Trade and Patent University in behavioral psychology, engineering, uh, all kinds of stuff that you need to have when you're evaluating patents. And in the three years since they opened that university, the number of patents processed per worker has doubled and the output of the agency has gone up more than 100%. Um, as people get really a sense of an esprit of an organization again. Uh, a sense of loyalty because these guys are investing in my education. They're not going to fire me. This is important because, you know, we destroyed the amity of the workplace over the last 10, 15 years with all those layoffs. And all the career books now advise people, loyalty out the window. You don't have to be loyal to the employer because they're going to fire you as quick as the bottom line says they should. So you should just treat them that way. Stiff them. If somebody offers you a better job, even though they just trained you, leave. And American management says, we cannot survive in that kind of an environment. We must reestablish the amity of the workplace. And the best way to do that, the researchers told them was, show them you mean it, invest in them, spend money on training, you tight wads. And that's what they're doing, and they're reducing the turnover. And as they do that, they are fulfilling the forecast. <sighs> Fulfilling the forecast made 10 years ago by the MIT Commission on Industrial Productivity when they said, without major changes in the ways that schools and firms train workers over the course of a lifetime, no amount of macroeconomic fine-tuning or technological innovation will be able to produce a significantly improved economic performance and a rising standard of living. So in fact, we are reinventing education. Uh, both post-secondary education, K through 12, and what we found is that we can't do that by ourselves. The schools can't do it by themselves. Certainly the employers can't do it by themselves. It has to be a collaboration of the community members and the polity along with the economy. And that's what you have done here in Oregon pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. You have, in fact, engaged all of the community members in understanding, hey, we're trying to do revolutionary things here in our public school system. And what you understand, this is not going to be easy. And it would be swell, of course, if we could simply shut down the school system while we reinvent it. Okay, all you parents, keep the kids at home for the next couple of years. We're going to reinvent the schools. Okay, and then we've changed the classrooms, installed internet, put all the terminals in, realigned the classrooms. Okay, bring them back. No, uh, no, we got to change this thing while it's running. And in some respects, that's harder than building one from scratch. So in fact, uh, we, we've been open about that as the reports have come from Oregon, uh, that they have gone to the students and said, listen, uh, I know some of your parents are probably complaining that uh, we're using you as guinea pigs. Well, you know what? We are using you as guinea pigs. And therefore, we want to have feedback from you. you. We want you to be a part of this restructuring an active part of this reinvention of education. Now, I said that to the audience this morning at Cleveland High School. And afterwards, some of the teachers came up and they said, well, yes, they have involved the students, but usually after the fact, when it goes wrong, rather than beforehand to tell them, you know, this is going to be a problem. Well, OK. It says, number one, the media has not been entirely honest about reporting that. And number two, it says, OK, Let's learn from our mistakes, guys. Let's go back and actually try to do this right. 
And certainly there have been several attempts by uh, people in this state to roll back that reform, to go back to three R's and to support uh, more uh, traditional fundamentalist, uh, you know, we get back to the basics, uh, maybe have uniforms in the classroom, uh, reduce the teacher-student ratio, everything will be fine. Not as long as only 25% of all people learn effectively in a passive classroom setting, the way you are doing just now. <laughs> If, uh, until we can figure out a way to overcome that, the only way that you're going to guarantee success for every student and competence for every person through public education, it is to extend experiential learning and project work and community service so people can understand this isn't just abstract theory I'm learning. This is a set of intellectual working tools to apply to real world problems. And that's what you've been doing in your education system. And while we're at it, it isn't just the education system, you know. Uh, Portland City is held up as a paragon of virtue, the most livable big city in America. People come from all over the world to see how you do that. And, and in fact, you've got your own local myth about how you do that. Well, it's the land use law, and we've forced the density, so we've got away with sprawl. And then to deal with the outlying communities, we got new types of technology, a transport technology, not heavy rail, not more highways, for gosh sake, we got our light rail. And in fact, Washington County, is now about to shape all of its development around its light rail. That's a heroic thing. So we're going to put the light rail in and we're going to back away and let this thing develop. And if it does it the way we have expected, we will have this array of urban villages instead of a giant urban sprawl. So here you are doing exactly what the founding fathers said you were supposed to be doing at this point. 200 years ago, they said, uh, that we shall reserve substantial powers to the state and local government, that they may serve as civic laboratories to solve such problems as progress will inevitably present us with. Well, progress is presenting us with some pretty impressive problems here using information technology to make things better. And I haven't even addressed some of them yet. We, didn't, we haven't even talked about privacy. How are we going to deal with that? And some of the other new technologies coming along, genetic engineering, oh, pretty scary. But that doesn't mean we should recoil from that. That doesn't mean we should pass a moratorium that says, hey, no, no, we're not going to have information technology until we've figured out what to do about this privacy thing. Uh, we're not going to have genetic engineering until we've figured out just how to be sure that nothing that we don't expect is going to happen. Well, maybe we want to have some things that happen that we don't expect. Half of all scientific breakthroughs occur by accident. So it's uh, maybe not necessary that we want to avoid. We just want to avoid big accidents, right? It's hard for little ones. America is at the head of the family of nations as we embrace a new world order. Uh, and as uh, historian Stephen Ambrose said of 1998, Two score years from now, the children of today's preschoolers will be asked by their college professors to pinpoint the moment in time when time and distance collapsed, and they will point to 1998. And now we wired the world so that we are a global village. We are all integrated. And the economic world was more radically redrawn in 1998 than it has been in many decades. There were economic crises that whipped around the world faster than at any time in history. There were mergers the size of which would have been absurd a couple of years ago. There was an explosion of electronic commerce on the internet led by Amazon that saw its stock increase tenfold in 12 months. And as all that and more happened, the U.S. government was snarled and incapacitated by scandal, seeming to prove its own growing irrelevance. No, it's not irrelevance. It's just that the economy is doing what the founding fathers said would happen. They said most of the time. Uh, all we want government to do is stand back and let the ball roll. The free market should permit people to realize their potential, have upward mobility, solve all the problems without any government intervention. But once in a while, you're going to need government regulation. You're going to need intervention because of excess or problem in the system. So you've got to have a credible and substantial governance present and ready. But it's got to know that there are going to be certain times when the best thing to do is 
pass a moratorium on internet taxes. Let's let this thing get more robust before we start to tinker with it. We might kill the baby in the actual birthing process if we act to intervene too quickly. So that's where we are now in America, in this revolutionary moment, two thirds of the way through the revolution. So now mostly it's good news. From the next 50, 20, 25 years, it's a rising tide that is gonna lift most of the boats. That doesn't mean we won't have uh, recessions. Sure, we'll have recessions, but they'll be shallower than the recessions of the last 10, 20 years. And when we come out of each recession in the next 20 years, uh, we'll be higher and bigger and more prosperous than when we went in, as opposed to the last 20 years when in every recession, uh, the economy was smaller and poorer when it came out of each recession than when it went in. So we're at this great, wonderful moment of opportunity. Uh, that's why we, uh, my partner and I refer to this moment as uh, the roller coaster 2000. Uh, we didn't like uh, the notion of a wave of creative destruction. It sounded pretty messianic. And beside, how many people actually encounter waves of destruction in their lives? Not much, but most everybody has ridden a roller coaster at least once. And in fact, uh, the older we get, the less we are likely to want to ride one again, right? <laughs> I mean, what you get out of a roller coaster ride is an adrenaline rush. And most of us, by the time we're 40, have had all the pleasure out of an adrenaline rush that we care to have. But every once in a while, we have to ride the roller coaster out of circumstance. What? Oh, you want granddad to ride the roller coaster with you? Yeah, oh, I love roller coasters. Sure, I'll, I'll be right along. Uh, and you're going to go ahead and you're going to ride the roller coaster even though you know you're going to hate it. Partly for the love of the child and partly because you know it's a finite experience. It's only two and a half minutes long. All I have to do is hold on tight, clench my teeth, close my eyes and not throw up <laughs> for about two and a half minutes and I'll be able to walk away from the experience and it'll be, hey, how about that? Granddad rode the roller coaster with you. Is that great or what? Yeah, no, I'm going over to the men's room now. I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> well, that's where we are. And what I tried to convey this evening is that this is a finite experience. We are now most of the way through this tunnel. And we can now begin to see the light at the end of that tunnel. And it's going to get bigger and brighter with every passing year. And within 10 years, suddenly everybody's going to realize we did it. We have reinvented America. We've made this place better than we ever thought it could be. And what's more, we have made it better for more of us Americans than we ever thought we could. And while we're at it, we probably have done pretty well in terms of helping the rest of the world. This is a great moment to be alive, to be an Oregonian, to be a Portlander, to be an American. And I hope you take advantage of this great opportunity. Thank you very much.